Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a series on stewardship entitled Stewardship Motives of the Heart. And this lesson has a very interesting title, I See, I Want, I Take. This is lesson two in that series for January 13 of 2018. Do you recognize anything in yourself of when you think about the title there, I see, I want, I take? Well, let's, let's see what we can get from this lesson. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you recognizing our natural sinful tendencies. Help us to overcome them by looking at you, by recognizing what an incredible life you lived here on this earth, what an incredible example you left us. May we come to be more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this lesson is going to focus on covetousness and greed. Would you say covetousness and greed are fairly common in our society? Almost synonymous, isn't it? So it is. <laughs> okay. But not in the Adventist church, of course. Well, every, I think everybody is, to some extent or another, is motivated by, motivated by fear and greed. I don't think anybody is, is exempt from those things, and, and the adversary plays on our fear and our greed by using deception yeah. and extortion, which is all the antithesis of love. Yeah. Well, Ellen White had a very interesting vision once. She actually saw the devil speaking with his we sometimes call them henchmen, the, his associates up there and wherever they meet, I don't know. And she said she heard these words from the devil himself. Now, we don't often quote the devil, but Carrie, I'm going to let you play the devil's role right now. All right. Go, make the possessors of lands and money drunk with the cares of this life. Present the world before them in its most attractive light that they may lay up their treasure here and fix their affections upon earthly things. We must do our utmost to prevent those who labor in God's cause from obtaining means to use against us. Keep the money in our own ranks. The more means they obtain, the more they will injure our kingdom by taking from us our subjects. Make them care more for money than the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom and the spread of the truths we hate. And we need not fear their influence, for we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power and will finally be separated from God's people. Wow. That's a, one of Ellen White's early books, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 339, second paragraph. Wow, wow. No, wasn't most of spiritual, no, no, it's spirit of prophecy. Yeah, spirit of prophecy. That was kind of the basis for the Desire of Ages, Great mm -hmm. Controversy series. The Conflict of the Ages series. Conflict yes. of the Ages series. Why, why doesn't this comment go through to there? I think that if you look at, if you compare the conflict, I mean, if you compare the spirit of prophecy series with the Conflict of the Ages series, the five major volumes, what you realize is this. The Spirit of Prophecy series was written intentionally for Adventists themselves. And she's much more bold in talking about her visions and what she saw in vision and so forth like this. When she moved over to do the Conflict of the Ages series, those were intended for the general public. So she took out a lot of the obvious stuff that she saw in vision. She put in more general terms and so forth like that. Not that it was different, but that was, it was for a different audience. So if you, th that's the major difference between those two sets. So I would really encourage every Adventist to get that, those four little facsimile versions, or much easier to get the, the, the disc, which is available for a very cheap price, about $20, uh, now, and you get everything that Ellen White has made public, everything that the White Estate has made public. But look at those little books, the, the four volumes, Spirit of Prophecy, because they are some very incredible, outstanding comments in there, of course, intended primarily for an Adventist audience. 
So, coming back to Satan's comment, how well do you think he's doing with his approach? I think he hit right on it. <laughs> you think he's doing pretty, hitting a home run, huh? Yeah. So one of the one of the things he he said was keep the money in our own ranks. Mm -hmm. So in the devil's ranks. So does that mean that a Christian who is rich is special it, target? It, yeah. Well, how, how do we interpret? How do we put that together? Mm -hmm. If we're well, supposed to keep the money in our own ranks of the devil's, the devil's ranks, why is a Christian rich? Is he part with the devil? Satan I hope not. Full control of the, that. Yeah. God can bless as well. So he's the devil is saying that because he recognized that some people have money on the other side and he doesn't like it. So. Like Abraham and Job, yeah. huh? Well, greed has reached into the Christian evangelism scene. Put simply, many popular television preachers and have <coughs> enormous con <coughs> congregations are saying that God wants to bless you and are saying that if you serve him, he will bless you. In fact, he will make you wealthy. And of course, they drive around in fancy cars and own big homes and private planes and so forth. They say, you see? We're serving God, we have all this wealth, that's the proof, right? They say that if you follow God, he blesses you with wealth and health. So is God in the business of promoting materialism? Well, what about Deuteronomy 28? And, and we could go back to Deuteronomy 7 and Leviticus 26 that say basically the same thing. What does it say there? If you follow me, you'll be rich. If you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, he will make you greater than any other nation on earth. Obey the Lord your God and all these blessings will be yours. The Lord will bless your towns and your fields. The Lord will bless you with many children, with abundant crops and with many cattle and sheep. I mean, isn't that, doesn't that sound a little materialistic? Or is that just for the Jews? It's a different era. It, it can work these days too, but I think we, we've got to look at things like health. We've gained tremendously in our church and, and longer living, mm -hmm. less illness. It doesn't say you don't get ill, we, mm -hmm. but I think that's another side we don't, we're starting to hear more about, both ourselves and in the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. In order to give, you have to have something to give. So yeah. well, uh, it depends on what, you, what you're focusing on. Are you focusing on the getting or are you focusing on the idea that I have more to give now? Mm -hmm. Well, if, if we say to God, okay, I will do this for you if you will do that for me, is that just a business deal? James 1.13, God cannot be tempted and, you, and yes. he tempts no one. So okay. how do you put that into the equation? Well, well, so what does that have to do with faith? I mean, you know, to come back to one of our common expressions. Look at 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 7. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know what God's grace has accomplished in the churches in Macedonia. They have been severely tested by the troubles they went through, but their joy was so great that they were extremely generous in their giving, even though they are very poor. I can assure you that they gave as much as they could and even more than they could. Of their own free will, they begged us and pleaded for the privilege of having a part in helping God's people in Judea. I, it was more than we could have hoped for. First they gave themselves to the Lord, and then by God's will they gave themselves to us as well. So we urged Titus, who began his, this work, to come to continue it and help you complete this special service of love. You are so rich in all you have, in faith, speech, and knowledge, in your eagerness to help, and in your love for us. And so we want you to be generous also in this service of love. Do you know anybody that's uh, given more than they are even capable of giving? What else? What else? Yeah. Yeah? In the Bible? Yeah. The widow who fed Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. Over and over and over. Uh, I don't have time to discuss it right now, but Paul apparently wrote four different letters to the Corinthians. 
And this first part of 2 Corinthians is probably his fourth letter. And it was written just after he had received the, finally received the message from the Corinthians. Okay, please come back. We want to have you. We'd like to spend some time with you. Help us get things straightened out here. And he was so overjoyed that they wanted him to come back that he was, he was sort of bubbling over in this part of 2 Corinthians. So maybe that had something to do with what he was saying there. I don't know. He said, we still need to finish the work here and finish collecting money in Macedonia for the people there in General Conference headquarters. Hmm. So why do you think those Macedonians and those Greeks were so generous for the Christians in Jerusalem? Did Paul say something? Did he promise anything to them? We have no evidence of that. It's interesting that in other places, uh, Paul seems to suggest that the Philippians maybe were fairly well off. Is this talking about a different group? And what about our age? Is, well, Thessalonians is, would have been in Macedonia <coughs> also. Yeah. They're, Bereans, they're all both, of them. Both, all of that's kind of up in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, we, didn't, we don't have to go back to the Bible to teach us that the cares of this life and its riches are temporary. Not only are, is our lives short in terms of God's reality, but, uh, I mean, even a lot of people can't keep a significant amount of wealth even as long as they live. Helen Keller, that you're all familiar with, a blind and deaf scholar, once said, the most pathetic person in the world is someone who has sight but has no vision. What is she, what is she talking about there? Is that true? Quite often. Yeah. Gary, would you read our next passage there from, uh, that would be from Spiritual Gifts? Sure. Some love this, this world so much that they swallow up their love for the truth. As their treasure here increases, their interest in heavenly treasures decrease. The more they possess of this world, the more closely do they hug it to them. As if fearful, they covet treasures would be taken from them. The more they possess, the less they do they have to bestow on others. For the more they have, the poorer they feel. All the de deceitfulness of riches, they will not feel the wants of the cause of God. Wow. That was written in 1860. Hmm. What do we know about the Adventist church in 1860? They were pretty poor and they... Really on its feet. Pretty much... I don't think it had formed yet. There wasn't really? even an Adventist church in 1860. Mm -hmm. The Seventh Adventist Church wasn't formed until 1863. The bottom line is people weren't that well off generally. And James White used to work very hard in the fields for people like 50, for 50 cents per day in order to pay for printing and sending out some of the early papers. Incredible. Ellen White. Ellen White herself tells a story about how she and her, her sister worked for 25 cents a day. And between the two of them, they saved up $30 to give to the cause of God to try to spread the gospel. The two of them, young girls, I mean, they were 12 and 13 or something like that. How, how long would it take you to earn enough money earning 25 cents a day to save up $30? That's a lot of work. And they, they had certain, a certain amount of expenses they had to cover for themselves as well. Now, when you said to give the money to the cause, how would they do that? Well, in, th in those days, they were actually members of the Methodist Church. And so, but they were, they were very anxious. In the early days, the, the, the Advent message was going through all the churches. 
and then eventually they got kicked out and so forth. But in those early days, I don't know what exact how exactly the money was used, but it would be probably to buy literature or to pay for printing or or to pay for some pastor to go around and spread the Adventist message, something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, in Matthew 13, we're told the story about the man who went out to sow. And remember, he, he sowed and some of the seed fell on the pathway and the birds picked it up and some of the seed fell in, in shallow ground among the stones and so forth and it was warm and it sprang up quickly but there was no de depths to it and some of the, you know, different places. But some of it fell on the good soil and grew up and, and yielded 30, 60, and 100 fold. Do you, do you um, think we could actually see fulfillments of that sort of parable, that sort of prophecy in the church today? In explaining that parable, Jesus talked about the deceitfulness of riches, and talking about the, the, the plants that would grow up quickly and then sort of died out because there wasn't any depth of soil. What's the deceitfulness of riches? Chokes out the word and it becomes unfruitful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as many of you out there are aware, if, if you've listened to this program before, I spent a number of years in Africa and loved my African friends out there. Today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is growing in membership very rapidly as churches go. But almost all of those new members are in the third world countries where wages are low. In the past, people here, the membership in the United States and Canada and Australia, along with some help from Europe, supported the work in those poorer countries. But that's no longer possible. What are the implications for the church? Thought about that? Well, what, you need to use simpler means then. What, uh, what percentage of the Adventist church membership is living in third world countries today? Only a major portion of it, I think. Over 90%. Yeah. Over 90%. <clears throat> well, it should be able to go a lot better because they don't have the riches the, to oh. tear things up, right? Well, but when you look at the overall political scene in most of Africa, there's wars every which way you look. Mm -hmm. They've had to run and hide. They've been killed. Churches have been burnt to the ground. Dying of HIV. We haven't quite got to that state here, but I think it's not that far off in some ways. Yeah. Well, our lesson asks us to look at the story of Eve back in, in, in Genesis 3. And you know, Eve wandered a little away from Adam. He wasn't paying attention. She wasn't paying attention. And suddenly she found herself looking up at that tree of knowledge of good and eat, evil. Um, they had a wonderful, they, they loved their work. They were very happy in the garden. And Apparently, they, as far as we know, they just sort of hadn't realized that they were sort of wandering apart from each other. I always have to chuckle a little bit when I think about that because Martin Luther, God bless his soul, and on the 500th anniversary of his nailing those theses on the door of the church there at Wittenberg, but um, he said, if Adam had come to that tree, he would have resisted the devil. Good. Very strong well, Paul male says, dominant society. Well, Paul says that, uh, that, that Eve was deceived, but Paul, that uh, Adam was not. And uh, in your Good News translation, it, it uh, says, so she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then she gave it to some of her husband, and he also ate it. But if you look in the King James, it says, uh, that uh, she took the fruit and ate it and then she gave to her husband who was with her. And there are people in our church who will say Ellen White was wrong because the Bible says that Adam was there with her. In the uh, garden, not necessarily at that's, the tree. That's my answer too, you know, because I can't imagine if he was not deceived standing there and watching this all go down and not intervening somehow. Uh, now I, 
Okay, I'm going to follow your, your thought there. Try to imagine yourself being one of the angels maybe in heaven or one of the beings in the rest of the universe watching that scenario. And they're going further and further apart and she's getting closer and closer to the three. How many of the beings in the rest of the universe had their eyes glued on that to see what was going to happen? And how come no one went down and said, Eve, get back. Adam, get back with her. God forbid it. They had to have free choice. Well, does the serpent's approach to Eve sound like a, a little bit like a modern advertising agency? She saw the fruit, how beautiful it looked. It appeared to be delicious. I mean, she'd, had, she'd tried lots of other new fruits and they were all delicious. When the serpent spoke to her and suggested that it was very desirable, she wanted it. Remember, I see, I want. What happens next? Look at I take. So she took it. Thus we see the three steps in greed. One of the worst things about greed and covetousness is that they are quiet sins. That is, they happen inside of us. No one else can observe what is actually going on in our minds. King Ahab coveted the vineyard of Naboth and pouted over it until his queen arranged for Naboth to be murdered so that Ahab could have the vineyard. 1 Kings 21. Achan saw and wanted the Babylonian garment, the silver and the gold. Very soon he found himself taking them and burying them in his tent, thus leading to the destruction of himself and his entire family in Joshua 7. Okay. Um, Dennis, I think you've got our next one there. Yes, this is uh, from John Harris in his uh, book Mammon. Um, and it reads, if selfishness is the prevailing form of sin, covetousness may be regarded as the prevailing form of selfishness. This is strikingly in intimidate, intimated. In intimated by the Apostle Paul when describing the perilous times, 2 Timothy 3.1, of the final apostasy. He represents uh, selfishness as the prolific root of all the evils which will then prevail, and covetousness as its first fruit. Uh, quoting from 2 Timothy 3.2, for, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, unquote. Yeah, wow. So is covetousness the basis for virtually all other sins? Do we have any evidence from, for that from, from the Bible? You want something that doesn't belong to you. Well, it's, it's trying to bring things in rather than trying to give. Well, trying let me to read get. to you the 10th the commandment. Do not desire another man's house. Do not desire his wife, his slaves, his cattle, his donkey, or anything else that he owns. That's covetousness, right? You remember what Paul says about that in Romans 7? He, he says, I didn't even know what sin was like until I realized that God is saying, you, you can't not only not take it, you can't even want to take it. And what did Paul say? He says, when I first read that, it made me angry. He says, man, what is God doing? He's trying to mess with my mind. You know, and then he realized, hey, that's a good thing. Because if God's going to take people to heaven who are trying to take other people's things, heaven's not going to be better than what we have here, right? Well, look at Isaiah 56, verse 11. They are like greedy dogs that never get enough. These leaders have no understanding. They each do as they please and seek their own advantage. Sound basically familiar? It seems that people of power in Isaiah's day were as greedy as many people seem to be today. Greed, covetousness, and selfishness are the absolute antithesis of the character of Christ. Paul said, and I quote, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that um, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. So, in what areas of our society do we see the most obvious greed and covetousness? Anybody want to speculate there? Everywhere. Everywhere. Yes. Got to be. 
in business, stock market, even national economies. But you know. not in our church, is it? Oh, now, Gordon, how could you suggest a thing like that? Oh, I was, I was saying it wasn't. Oh, I see. <laughs> or was that sarcasm? <laughs> hmm. So should we, can we covet the good stuff? Well, I would like can to, you, I covet a position. covet wanting God to be with you? Could you sounds like a good thing. Paul what? says that, that we should aspire to the better gifts, you know, that mm -hmm. we may prophesy. Think about Judas. You know what, how he ended up. I mean, I would, I mean, wouldn't you each one of, wouldn't each one of us give almost anything for the privileges that Judas in, enjoyed? I mean, three and a half or even two years. We don't know exactly how long he was with Jesus, but even two years walking and talking and, 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 and being with Jesus, performing miracles, following his orders, going out and witnessing to others. And what happened to Judas? His greed and love for money over, overruled every other good thing in his life. And what happened? Well, you know. I, well, he was really patient, waiting for the, the good stuff to come in from, yeah. from being a leader. Yeah. Gordon, I think uh, I asked you to read Desire of Ages there. Page 295, first paragraph. How tenderly the Savior dealt with him who was to be his betrayer. In his teaching, Jesus dwelt upon principles of benevolence that struck at the very root of covetousness. He presented before Judas the heinous character of greed. And many a time the disciple realized that his character had been portrayed and his sin pointed out, but he would not confess and forsake his unrighteousness. Wow. How sad, and then he ended up killing himself. He actually reached the place where he believed, he thought by, by betraying Jesus to the, to the Jews that he would force him to exercise his power and become the king of the Jews, and then Luke, uh, 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 Judas would be honored for being the one who managed finally to convince him that he had to do that. He thought he was going to become prime minister of the new Jewish nation by forcing Jesus, by, by portraying Jesus to the, to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. I mean, how twisted can your thinking become? Well, would it be safe for God to admit to having greedy people with all the wealth available there? They just suck it all in. Instead of trying to give as, as, as it is in the kingdom. It's just the opposite. I've, I've told this story before, and perhaps you even heard it out there, but there's a, there's a apocryphal story that goes something like this. Word came down from heaven that God had decided he would allow people to come to heaven with one suitcase, whatever they could put in one suitcase. And this rich guy thought, wow, so he started collecting lots of money, and then he realized, you know, maybe heaven won't recognize U.S. currency. So he said, I know, I'll buy gold. So he bought all these bars of gold, he'd collect a bunch of money, he'd buy a, buy, buy a, a, a gold ingot, a gold bullion there, and he stuffed a whole suitcase full of gold. And of course it was like almost impossible to pick it up, I mean as heavy as that was. But here he comes staggering up to the, you know, the, the story about Peter at the gate. So he comes staggering up, to, staggering up to Peter there with his suitcase full of gold. And Peter says, uh, welcome. Um, what do you have in your suitcase? Oh, and the guy beams, you know, because he thinks, man, I mean, nobody has come here with more wealth and better, anything better than what I got. So he opens his suitcase and there's all that gold. And Peter looks and says, why would you want to bring all that pavement up here? Because <laughs> the streets of heaven are paved with gold, right? Yes. Why would you want to bring all that pavement up here? 
Well, since you have an apocryphal story, I'll, okay. I'll give an, one, too, that's an illustration. Maybe you've heard this before, but uh, a man is touring hell, and he sees that everybody is lean and, and thin and wasting away, and he asks his guide, don't these people have something to eat? And so he said, yes, and shows them these tables heaped high with food, and uh, then he shows them the utensils. They've got a handle, and they're very long with the spoon or fork on the other end, and the rest is all uh, sharp, and so they can't choke up on it. So they can't feed themselves. Mm. So they go to heaven. They're looking around. Everybody's well fed. Shows them the same tables full of food, same utensils. And the man says, well, what's the difference? And the guide says, here they feed each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Well, Galatians 5.22 has something to say to us. Look at, look, look at this, 22 to 25. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Now, isn't that a contradiction? Well, he goes on, there is no law against such things as these. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have put to death their human nature with all its passions and desires. The Spirit has given us life. He must also control our lives. We must not be proud or irritable of one another or be jealous of one another. Okay, so let's look at here. Uh, it goes on in, 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 in the NIV saying, putting to death human nature with all... I mean, actually, it's in, in the Good News Bible. Putting to death human nature with all its passions and desires and the Spirit, uh, the contrast between that and the Spirit control of our lives. And 2 Peter 1, 5 to 9, we, look, we read even in, in Peter's ladder, right in the middle of Peter's ladder, there's, there's self-control and there's endurance. You, know, you, just, you struggle alone, you, just, you, you don't give up. So how can we overcome selfishness, greed, and covetousness with the help of the Holy Spirit and still maintain self-control, which is the gift of the Spirit? Isn't that a contradiction? So what do we want? Do we want God controlling our lives or we want... Self-control. Well, Self-control is the way it's going to be. So, and the, the old saying, let go and let God, not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus came to do the will of the Father, so, he, you know, he obviously exercised his choice, mm -hmm. self-control, to, to submit to the will of the Father rather than to do his own will. So now let's see about this. If we were all controlled by God, would we have to give up our freedom? Depends on how, how you picture the, the mechanics of that, you know. It, okay, so that's my I next mean, question. So, I mean, if, you know, how, how do you picture that? Is God then uh, t taking away, when you give him your will, is he taking away your will? Or is he just enabling you to... Uh, abide in his presence and become partakers of all the the good things that he is and has and and then you can be a channel of his grace to others as well. What would happen though if you wanted to do something and you didn't have the strength to do it? What would happen? Well, to you'd have what? to find are, to are do you anything. About physical to uh, do anything, something? well, even to be good or even to be helpful or even to be well, loving. Say that you don't have the strength to do it and you want to do it. And you go to God and ask for, for more. Be like well, isn't the, that what he's given you? He's given you the, the strength, the power, the ability. Measure. Okay, and let's, let's, let's be as specific as we can. What tools or methods, whatever you choose to call them, does the Holy Spirit have to help us overcome greed? Him. How does that work? Being with you. He bring, keeps before us uh, the, the, Holy the face of Jesus. You. The Holy Spirit isn't with you. Uh, how far are you going to get? Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm not arguing with that a bit. I'm just saying, okay, now the Holy Spirit is here. What, what's going to change in my life? What's going to be different? The Holy Spirit is, is the spirit of truth and how you respond to it. But another part of the equation is God is our protector. 
because mm -hmm. sin left to run its own course will destroy everything in its path mm -hmm. and even collateral damage. Jesus was not sinful and yet he was <laughs> poor, suffered he, he, at, the, at, the, uh, at the hands of God's creatures. The Creator suffered at, suffered at the hands of His creatures, mm -hmm. and uh, but God is, a, is a, our protector, and but God can, can't manipulate, and ultimately, what He does is throttle, so to speak, the the efforts of, of the evil one and his minions. Yeah. So, well, how well, do we uh, respond to truth? Is what it boils down to. Yeah. God is gives. He came here. 2,000 years ago to bear witness to the truth. Another way of saying it is to show the truth about God and the way he is. Yeah. One of the ways it's been suggested by Jesus himself is working with the poor or giving generously to support God's work for the poor. Remember Matthew 25? Those, you know, there's, those, a lot of, there's a lot of atheists that work for the poor. Well, and maybe God will bless them to a certain degree for doing that. But if you don't believe in God, how do you Well, you may not believe in the, in the false picture of God that has been portrayed yeah. to you. Well, I don't know. There's some people that are adamant. They don't believe in God. And well, they, they will, are very... They will argue that point because they consider God to be the antithesis of, of what, uh, what they really want to believe in when, in fact, what they want to believe in may be exactly what God is. In other words, generous mm -hmm. and loving and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So might be. So how do we how do we <laughs> develop yeah, self-control and learn to do things as Jesus did? Have how many of us have really sacrificed in order to give? Sacrificed in order to give, like the woman with the two mites? Well, Myra, I think I asked you to look at uh, the next one, Desire of Ages 87. Yes. Some incredible words about Jesus when he was still young, very young. Very young. Jesus worked to relieve every case of suffering that he saw. He had little money to give, but he often denied himself of food in order to re relieve those who appeared more needy than he. His brothers felt that his influence went far to counteract theirs. He possessed a tact which none of them had, or even desired to have. When they spoke harshly to the poor, de degraded beatings, Jesus sought those very ones. He spoke to them words of encouragement. To those who were in need, he would give a cup of cold water and would quietly place his own meal in their hands. As he relieved their sufferings, the truths he taught were associated with his acts of mercy and were thus riveted in their memory. Desire of Ages 87. I mean, Jesus was preaching and doing a marvelous work while he was still very young, incredibly young. I mean, unbelievable. Well, it's that, fair. Yeah, hmm? the, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful and also in much. So, uh, you know, when we think of the, the great big miracles that Jesus did, you know, that seems so far off, but it really starts with doing the little things. Yeah. And as we're faithful in those, God is able to give us greater uh, situations and opportunities. Would it be fair to say that the ultimate goal, the ultimate human goal is to be happy and satisfied? I would like to suggest, and our, and our Bible study guide supports this, that human materialism will never accomplish that. Jim, you want to read us that next paragraph? Materialistic values are associated with a pervasive undermining of people's well-being. From low life satisfaction and happiness, to depression and anxiety, to physical problems such as headaches, and to personality disorders, narcissism, and antisocial behavior. Wow. Okay. Why do you think the prosperity gospel is so popular? I mean, look at these mega churches. It appeals to our carnal nature. It looks looks good. Uh, it 
you know, being able to get something for from God, you know, that all sounds good. You've worked hard and you can't seem to succeed and you're still poor and you go to one of these churches and God promises to make you wealthy. I mean, what more could you ask for? Right? That's the oldest philosophy there is. That's what the Job's four friends uh, preached. Mm -hmm. And if all those people go there, it must be true. Yeah. Mm, right. Obvious. Well, we know that members of the royal family of England and wives of presidents here in the United States have often taken up special challenges to try to deal with major troubles which face our world. Can you think of some examples? Uh, AIDS crisis, yeah. uh, the poor, uh, the people who are starving, children in other uh, countries and such. Uh, the drug problem. The drug problem is a major issue. Exercises have been a real problem. Just, just do it, if you remember. Well, one sage once wrote, if we are looking for the source of our troubles, we shouldn't test people for drugs. We should test them for stupidity, ignorance, greed, and love of power. Amen. So you think that would be a good approach, right? If only we had those tests. I was <laughs> <laughs> just thinking how we would write that. We, we have some interesting tests we use in the clinic. One, there's one for anxiety, and there's other one for depression, and of course there's tests for you know, high blood pressure and diabetes and all those kind of things. We need a test for greed and love of power and stupidity and ignorance. Hmm. <laughs> wonder what that would be like. <laughs> well, remembering Paul's statement in Galatians 5.22 about the fruit of the Spirit, would you say that God's control is really better than self-control? Well, we can't have, because we're free moral agents, we can't have the things of God unless we choose them. And that's where self-control, our will comes in, is are we going to choose our way or his way? Mm -hmm. um, if that's, our will is taken away from us, then we're just Calvinists. <laughs> well, be careful there. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, will God need to monitor us everywhere we go and everything we do when we get to heaven, make sure we don't do anything we're not supposed to do? Or wouldn't it be better to have self-control in heaven so that you would choose to do what's right because it is right? It's only our connection to him that, that makes us able to do that. So mm -hmm. we will, you know, it's like Jesus said of the angels, uh, the little ones, that they continually behold the face of the Father which is in heaven. And that's really the ultimate goal of all of this. It's just that we can't do it in our sinful self uh, or we would be destroyed. So we behold the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Think about how we all start out. We are crying, wanting, you know, just give me, give me, give me everything. And uh, all we do for our family is poop and pee, you know. <laughs> That's not a very, I mean, that's, that's ultimate greed and want, isn't it? So how do we get from that to a place where we can separate our, our real needs from our wants? How do we do that? It's using the frontal lobes. Using the frontal lobes, okay. Discernment. Can we discern between our real necessities from our preferences? our real basic needs from embellishments. Now we're getting carried away here. Well, in Ephesians 4, Paul says, uh, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. And okay. To the Thessalonians, he has uh, some very similar, you know, that you should uh, uh, Keep your, I am almost there, 411. Um, uh, and make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands as, as we commanded you. And then in the second letter, he says, um, oh, it's chapter 3. Um, 
Now, such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. So there's all these little suggestions of, of doing things that, you know, to meet your needs and, and then does also it, does to share with others. Okay. If you work for the benefit of the poor, and I, I consider that I have a very privileged position because I work with the poor every day, all day long as in the clinic where I work. I think it's a real blessing. Does it make it easier to, to distinguish what real needs are after you face that kind of stuff all day long? Yeah. If we truly became like Jesus, would it be safe for God to return self-control to us? It would be, wouldn't it? Well, if we truly became like Jesus. But we ha he gives us self-control all along. It's, mm -hmm. There's never a point where he says, well, you can go off by yourself and do yeah. what, sh what you want to do. There's always that connection because he's, he's the source of all of this. He's mm -hmm. the source of love. You can't just take it in a bottle and go off by yourself. No. Um, it's, um, it's an ongoing relationship that we need to have in order to be able to to be, have something good to give to others. What is the emotional impact of dissatisfaction, discontent, greediness, coveting, and fantasizing about and loving material things? Depression. The guy that always wants more? Anxiety, pre depression, um, elation when you get it, and then depression when it slips away from you. And yeah. It's just a roller coaster uh, for some who have a measure of success at that. And One of the biggest challenges of dealing with greed and covetousness in the church is that those are largely secret sins. Many people are not aware of this, but I would challenge you to go and look. Uh, and if you um, can't figure it out for yourself, if you look in, um, in, in our website at the theox.org, that's T H E O X.org. Look under Teacher's Guides, under the uh, Teacher's Guides section, and look under in the one for Leviticus. And you'll realize that there was a death decree associated with every one of, breaking every one of the Ten Commandments except number 10. And why is that? It goes on in the mind. It goes on in the mind. It's pretty hard to, See you what's know, going on. it may be the most serious, but that's where sin starts. Right. I can't tell when someone else is covetous, yeah. except by their actions. Well, here's an incredible passage. God does not regard all sins as of equal magnitude. And we all should say, well, of course not. That, we don't think all sins are of equal magnitude, right? There are degrees of guilt in his estimation as well as in that of man. But however trifling this or that wrong act may seem in the eyes of men, and women I might add, no sin is small in the sight of God. No sin is small in the sight of God. Man's judgment is partial, imperfect. But God estimates all things as they really are. The drunkard is despised and told that his sin will exclude him from heaven, while pride, selfishness, and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are sins that are especially offensive to God, for they are contrary to the benevolence of his character, to that unselfish love, which is the very atmosphere of the unfallen universe. He who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need, and so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give, steps to Christ, page 30, first paragraph. Is it possible that there will be faithful Adventists who will not enter the kingdom of heaven while there are drunkards who will enter? They Don't look at me in a state of shock like that. <laughs> Where is it? Matthew, I want to say 14 or something like that. Lord, Lord, in your name I... That's seven. 
Seven. Matthew okay. seven. Matthew seven. Lord, right. Lord, in your name I prophesied. I yeah. did all these wonderful things. And God said, I never knew you. Yep. Uh, I think that's me. Matthew. Matthew seven, 21 to 23. Matthew seven, you want to read it for us? But does a drunk qualify to well, go in place of, you know, that's, that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, they would have to overcome their, dr their yeah, drinking. Because they can't think clearly. Mm -hmm. Well, in 25, he also, the judgment scene. Yeah. Yeah. So Whoever's uh, 721 says, Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. Mm -hmm. When the judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. Wow. That's Matthew seven twenty-one to 25. Okay. And then John seventeen three, e eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. Yeah. And to know means you, well, he says uh, in John 6, eat my flesh, drink my blood, and then I'll remember you in the, in the last day. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty well spelled out without uh, pummeling you into submission. If we are, it says that yeah. the, the judgment also in Matthew twenty-five yeah, thirty-one exactly. to uh, the end of the chapter yeah. goes over the same thing again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we are ever to overcome greed, selfishness, and covetousness, where should we start? With ourselves. If you well, yeah, but here's a, here's a clue. I'm gonna I'm gonna really. I mean, this is not. I didn't dream this up. This is from scripture and so forth. If you've ever had the experience of fighting this battle, you know that the earlier in the sequence you take action, the easier it is to avoid the sin. If covetousness and greed take the steps of, I see, I want, and I take, we should resist the first hint of covetousness and greed by simply turning our vision away. Don't look at it. But are, 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 aren't we still in Laodicea? Laodicea is blind. We're looking at, are trying to look in all the wrong places. Well, many of the saints in the Bible were quite wealthy. We've talked about that already. See, for example, Abraham, Joab, jo Job, I'm sorry, Boaz. These men clearly placed God in a position of top priority in their lives. So we should do our best to avoid looking at any sin, whatever that involves. Remember that Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell, Matthew 5, 29. Wow. What did he mean by that? Whatever stands in the way of yeah. the kingdom should be... Gotten rid of. Gotten rid of now. If, if that were, you know, plucking your eye out, uh, you know, in the, in the ultimate sense, it would be better to be blind yeah. and, and go to the kingdom and receive uh, spiritual eyesight. We don't, we, don't, um, we don't think about people doing that kind of thing today, but I can tell you I had another patient in my clinic today. People are basically plucking their eyes out by eating in our day. Mm -hmm. Diabetes is terrible in the way it affects your eyesight, retinopathy, and so forth like this. <clears throat> and they, they, they can't seem to stop eating, and pretty soon they can't see. Well, the second step in that sequence is wanting. James 4, 7, and 8 gives us some idea of how to deal with wanting. One, it says, resist the devil. Two, cleanse your hands. Three, purify your hearts. The only way to conquer the sin of wanting is to fill your mind and heart with Jesus Christ. When we do that and our thoughts are constantly of him, there will be no time or space for wanting things we should not want. And the final step in covetousness is the purchase point. I take. But even at that point, Christ promises us what? What does Christ promise us? I can do all things through Christ. This is Paul, in Paul's words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Our Bible study guide suggests through self-control, which for the Christian is nothing less than completely surrendering to divine control, which sounds like a contradiction, our thoughts, passions, and energies may be directed to use God's material blessings in accordance with his will. 
That's in the teacher section, page 30. What have you learned from this lesson about the relationship between self-control and divine control? What things could we as individuals or as groups do to help the poor and needy and begin to take our minds off of getting and taking? Well, we could visit the sick and disabled of the, of the church. We've got a whole hospital right here. Go up and talk to patients. Pray for them. We could assist in a Sabbath school class or pathfinders for the youth. Even as individuals, we could help by serving food at a homeless shelter. Our church helps to sponsor Helping Hands pa Pantry down near the, well, right beside the clinic where I work. And they pass out lots and lots of food to poor, poor people. We, we, feel, we feel, feed hundreds of families. If you want something to do, go down there and work with those people and begin to understand what kind of struggles they go through in their lives. You could raise money for a nonprofit organization. Three, you could help a local family, even a poor church family, with some need they have. Or four, visiting or encouraging people in a nearby prison. Um, have you ever been to a prison to try to work with prisoners? I once was part of a group that gave Bible studies to prisoners. They are very appreciative. At least the ones we worked with were very appreciative. I mean, someone, you know, it's, it's not easy to work in prison. You have to be vetted and you, it's not too complicated, but of course it depends on how secure the prison is. But you got to go in there and you got to go through all the security checks and so forth and get inside and then you, you realize that you're, you're, you're locked up in there along with them. So if we're going to learn to be like Jesus himself, wouldn't it be good to try practicing some of those things even now? If you'd like to get some ideas about how you might do that, remember that these lessons that we use here, that I prepare, uh, are available on our website uh, at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And we would challenge you to think about these things in connection with other members in your Sabbath school class. I'm not suggesting that this is better than what you get in your Bible study guide necessarily, but it's something different, something extra, something that might provoke a little extra discussion. And discussion is very good in the Sabbath school class and the situation in which we are living so close to the end of this earth's history. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, in this lesson we have found some real challenges. How can we become more like you by serving those who are most needy? You did it. We could do it. Help us to do that is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.